from Burlingame, California, it's theCUBE. Covering Sumo Logic Illuminate 2019. Brought to you by Sumo Logic. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at Sumo Logic Illuminate 2019. It's at the Hyatt Regency San Francisco Airport. We're excited to be back. It's our second year. It's the third year of the show. And really one of the kind of key tenets of this whole event is a report. It's the fourth year of the report. It's the continuous intelligence report. And here to tell us all about it is uh, the VP of Product Marketing, Kalyan Ramanathan. He's, like I said, VP Product Management of Sumo Logic. Great thank to see you again. All right, thank you, Jeff. What uh, a beautiful uh, report. Uh, absolutely, I love the cover and I love the data in the report even more. Yeah, but you cheat. You How cheat. Come? How come? Because it's not a survey. You guys actually take real data. Uh, that's exactly right, <laughs> exactly right. No, I, mean, I love yeah. it. Let, let's jump into it. No, it's, it's a pretty interesting fact, though, and, and it came out in the keynote that uh -huh. this is not a survey. That's this right. This is. Tell us how you get the data. Yeah, I mean, um, so as you very well know, uh, Sumo Logic is a continuous intelligence platform, right? And what we do is to help our customers manage the operations and security of their mission critical application. And the way we do that is by collecting machine data from our customers. And um, many of our customers, right, we have 2,000 odd customers, they're all running modern applications in the cloud, uh, and when we collect this machine data, we get great insights into how are these customers building their applications? How are these customers running and securing their application? And uh, that insight uh, is what is reflected in this report, right? Okay. So, and so you're exactly right, this is not a survey, this is data from our customers that we bring into our system, and then what we do is really three things uh, once we get this data into our system. First and foremost, we completely anonymize this data. Right, I was going so say, let's we make don't sure we get to get that out. Yes, right? absolutely. So we don't have any customer references in this data. Uh, two, we genericize this data. So you know, we are not looking for uh, one-off, uh, you know, uh, anomalies. We are looking for broad patterns, broad trends that we can apply across all of our customers and all of these enterprises that are running modern mission-critical applications in the cloud. And then three, we you know, analyze 10 ways to Sunday, right? Uh, we look at these datas, we look at what stands out, um, you know, in terms of good sample sizes, and uh, that's what we reflect in this report. Okay, and, and just to close the loop on that, are there some applications that you don't include because they're just legacy applications that are running on the cloud that doesn't give you good information, or do you, you're basically taking them all in? Yeah, that's a good point, right? I mean, we, we collect all data, right? And we collect all applications, so we don't, uh, uh, opt-in applications are, are, or out applications for that matter because we don't care about it. Uh, but, but what we do look for is a significant sample size, right? Because we want to make sure that uh, we are not talking about you know, onesie, twosie applications here or there. We are looking for applications that have significant adoption in the cloud, and that's what gets reflected in this, in this uh, report. Okay, well let's jump in. We don't have time to go through the whole thing here sure. now, but people can get it online, they can download their own version and go through it at their leisure. Biggest change from last year, it's the fourth year of the report. Yeah, I mean, look, um, there are three big uh, you know, insights that okay. we see in this, uh, in this report. Uh, and you know, the, the first one is, you know, while we continue to see AWS uh, you know, rule in the cloud, and that's not surprising at all, uh, we're starting to see uh, you know, pretty dramatic adoption of multi-cloud technologies, right? Uh, um, so, Two years ago, we saw a smidgen of multi-cloud you know, in this report. Uh, now, we have seen you know, almost a 50% growth year over year in terms of multi-cloud adoption amongst enterprises who are in the cloud. And that's a substantial jump, uh, albeit from a you know, smaller baseline. Right. Now, so uh, do you have visibility if those are new, net new applications or are those, are those existing ones that are migrating to different platforms, are they splitting? Do you have any kind of visibility into that? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point, and part of this is uh, very related to the growth of Kubernetes that we also see in this report, right? Uh, what we've seen is that in AWS itself, right, uh, Kubernetes adoption has gone up significantly. What's even more interesting is that as you think about multi-cloud adoption, um, we see a lot of Kubernetes, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, Kubernetes as, as the platform that is driving this multi-cloud adoption. Uh, there is a very interesting chart in this report, uh, you know, on page nine. I, Obviously, you know, I think your, your guys can, can see this if they, when they download the report. Yep. If you're looking at AWS only, right, we see one in five customers are adopting Kubernetes. Uh, if you're looking at AWS and GCP, uh, you know, Google Cloud Platform, we see almost 60% of our customers are adopting Kubernetes. Now when you put in AWS. One in five at AWS, 60% when you add Google, so that means four, Four out of five at, at, um, uh, at yeah, GCP yeah, or using almost, Kubernetes? Yeah, exactly. That yeah. Average up? And then if you Do look at math. AWS, Azure, and GCP, now you're talking about you know, the creme de la creme customers who, who want to adopt all three clouds, it's almost 80% adoption of Kubernetes. So what it tells you is that you know, Kubernetes has almost become this new Linux in the cloud world, right? Uh, if I want to deploy my application across multiple clouds, Guess what? Kubernetes is that platform that enables me to, to deploy my application and then port it and retarget it to any other cloud. Or for the matter, even an on-prem environment. Right, right. right? Now, you, I mean, you don't see motivation behind action, but I'm just curious how much of it is now that I have Kubernetes, you know, I can do multi-cloud, or I've been wanting to do multi-cloud, and now that I have Kubernetes, I have an avenue. Yeah, it's a thousand, thousand dollar question, right? What's the chicken and what's the egg right, out here? Right, right. Uh, my general sense, and you know, we have debated this endlessly in our company, our, our general sense has been that, uh, you know, the, the, the initiative to go multi-cloud typically comes top down in an, in an organization. It's usually the CIO or the CISO who says, you know what, we need to go multi-cloud. Uh, and there are various reasons to go multi-cloud, you know, some of which, which you heard in our keynote today, right? Uh, it could be for you know, more reliability, it could be for uh, you know, more choice that you may want, it could be because you don't want to get locked in to any one cloud vendor. So that decision usually comes top down. But then now the the engineering teams, the ops teams, how are, are you know have to uh, you know support that decision. And what these engineering teams and these ops teams have realized is that if they deploy Kubernetes, they have a very good option available now to port their applications very easily across these across these various cloud platforms. So Kubernetes, in some sense, is supporting the top-down decision to go multi-cloud which is uh, something that is you know, shown in spades uh, as a result of this report. Right. So another thing that jumped out at me, or I don't know, is there another top trend you want to make sure we cover before we get into some of the specifics? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, no, I mean, we can, we can talk to other yeah, trends I mean, too. One, I, of them, I, one of them that jumped yeah. out at me was Docker. Yes. The Docker adoption, right? Yeah. So Docker uh, you know, was the hottest thing since uh -huh. sliced bread about four years ago. And, and you know, kind of is, is the shade of Kubernetes, not that they're, you know, replacements for one another specifically, uh -huh. but, it, but it definitely put a little bit of a pall on the buzz that was the Docker. Yet, here, uh -huh. the Docker utilization, Docker uh, use is, is growing year over year. Docker, look, I mean, I, I, I'll, be the first one, I'll be the first one to tell you that Docker adoption has not stalled at all, right? Uh, you know, this is shown in the report, it's shown in customers that we talk to, right? I mean, everyone is down the path of containerize, containerizing their application. Uh, the value of Docker is indisputable, right? Uh, that I get better agility, that I get better portability with Docker uh, cannot be questioned. Now, what is indeed happening is that Everyone who is deploying Docker today is choosing a orchestration technology, and that orchestration technology happens to be Kubernetes. Kubernetes, right. You know, right. That, that again, you know, Kubernetes is the king of the hill. If I'm deploying Docker, I'm deploying Kubernetes along right, with it. Right, okay. Yeah. Another one that jumped out at me, which shouldn't be a big surprise, but in, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Andy Jassy. We do all the <laughs> AWS shows, and you know, one of always the shining moments is he throws up the slide, he's got the customer slide, but there you go. it's the services slide, mm -hmm. which is in like 2.6 font uh, across a 100 foot screen you know, that fills Las Vegas. And yet, your guys' findings is that it's really the top 10 applications are the vast majority of the AWS uh, offerings that are being consumed. Yeah, not just that, it's that the, the, the top services in AWS are the infrastructure as a service services, right? These are the core services that you need if you have to you know, build an application in AWS. You need EC2, I need S3, I need uh, uh, you know, identity and access management, otherwise I cannot even log into AWS, right? So, you know, this again sort of goes back to that, to that first point that I was making, was that 
You know, multi-cloud adoption is you know top of mind for many many um, customers right now. Many, it, it's it's something that many enterprises think of, and so if if I want to indeed be able to port my application from AWS to any other environment, guess what I should be doing? I shouldn't be adopting every AWS service out there because if I frankly adopted all these AWS services, the tentacles of you know, the cloud vendor are just so that I will not be able to port away from my cloud vendor to any other cloud service out there, right? right? right. So to a certain extent, right, I mean all these, many of the data points that we have in this report uh, support the story that enterprises are becoming more conscious of the cloud platform choices that they are making. They want to at least uh, keep an option of adopting the second or the third cloud out there and uh, they're consciously therefore choosing the services that they are you know, building their applications with. Right. It's so another hot topic, right? Com uh, Computer 101 is databases, yeah. right? We're just up the road yeah. from Oracle, Oracle Open World next week. A lot of verbal jabs between between Oracle and, and, and some of the cloud providers on the databases, et cetera. So what does the database findings look, come back as? I mean, look at the top four databases. Redis, MySQL, Postgres, Mongo. You know what's common across them? They're all open source. They're all open source database. So if you are building your application, find standard components that you can then you know, build your application on, where there's a community that you can then take and move to any other cloud that you want to. Right, that's, right. That's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two, look at where Oracle is in this, in this report. You know, I think they are the eighth database in the cloud. I actually talked to a few customers of ours today. Now is this also, are you, are you sampling from Oracle's Cloud, is that a data set? No, this is, uh, this is on this AWS. This is just AWS, this is just right, AWS, right, 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 okay, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right, I want to yeah, make sure. So, and okay. if, if, you know, if AWS is almost the universe of you know, cloud today, I right, mean, you know, right. we can debate it um, you know, some enough, bit, but word. it is close enough, I'd right. say. It sort of tells you where Oracle is in the sort of the cloud universe, right? right, so, right. so our friends at Redwood City you know, may talk about cloud day in and day out, but it's very clear that uh, you know, they're not making much of a dent in the cloud at this right. point. And then is this the first year, kind of a, the roll up of the type of database that NoSQL exceeded relational database? No, I mean, you know, we've been doing this for the last two years okay. now, and it's very clear that NoSQL is uh, you know, ahead of uh, SQL in the cloud. And I think the way we think about it is primarily because you know, when you are re-architecting your applications in the cloud, uh, the cloud, it sort of gives you a, a timeline, it gives, sort of gives you a opportunity to reconsider how you build out your data, data layer. And many of our customers are saying, you know, NoSQL is the way to go. Uh, you know, the scalability demands, uh, you know, the reliability demands of my application are such that I now have the opportunity to rethink and redo my 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 data my data layer, and frankly, you know, NoSQL is winning the right. game. It's winning big time. Yeah. Another another big one, serverless. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Lambda. Yes. I mean, I quite actually, I'm I'm kind of surprised it took so long to get to Lambda because right, we've been going to to smaller atomic units of of compute store and networking for so so long. But yeah. it sounds like looks like we're starting to hit you know, some critical mass here. Yeah, I mean look, Lambda is ready for prime time, right? I mean, we have seen the tipping point out here. Uh, you know, almost one in three customers of ours are using Lambda in production environments. And then if you sort of cast a wider net, right, go beyond production and look, even look at dev test, what we see is that almost 60% of Sumo Logic's customers, uh, you know, and if you look at 2,000 customers, that's a, it's a pretty big sample size. Almost 60% of our of the enterprises are using Lambda in some way, shape, or form, right? So, I, I think it's not surprising that Lambda is getting used, uh, you know, quite well in the enterprise. Um, the question really is, what are these people doing with Lambda, right? I mean, what's the intent behind the use of Lambda? And that's where I think, uh, you know, we have to do some more research. Uh, my general sense, and, and you know, I think it's shared widely within Sumo Logic, is that Lambda is still at the edges of the application. It's not at the core of the application. People are not building you know, your mission critical application on Lambda yet. Uh, because I think that that paradigm of thinking about event-driven you know, application is still a little foreign to, to many organizations. So I think um, you know, it'll take a few more years for Lambda, for, for an entire application to be built on Lambda. Right. right? Um, but you would think if it's, if it's 
you know, variable demand applications, whether that's uh, a marketing promotion around the Super Bowl yeah. or, you know, running the books at the end of the month. I guess it's easy enough to just fire up the servers versus versus doing a pure lambda yeah, at this point uh, in time. But Look, it I seems mean, like a, a natural fit, right? If you're doing a utility type application uh, and you know you want to start it and you want to you know kill it or you know not use it after an event has come and you know come and gone. Absolutely, Lambda is the way to go. The economics of Lambda, the way you uh, you know build Lambda, absolutely makes sense. Uh, you know, having said that, I mean, if you have to build a true mission critical application, you know, that you're going to be keeping on for uh, for a while to come, um, I'm not seeing a lot of that in Lambda yet. Right. Uh, but right. it's definitely getting there. Look, I mean, we have lots of customers who are building some 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 serious uh, you know stuff on Lambda. Right. Right. Uh, well, a lot, of, uh, a lot of great information. It's nice to have kind of the longitudinal aspect as you do this year over year. Yeah. And again, we're glad you're cheating because you're getting good data. <laughs> <laughs> you're not asking people questions. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'd like to finish out by saying, right, I mean, this is a, this is a report uh, that Sumo Logic builds every year, uh, not because we want to sell Sumo Logic, right? It's because we want to give back to our community. We want our community to build great apps. We want them to understand how their peers are building you know, some, some amazing mission critical apps in the cloud. And uh, so, you know, please download this report, learn from how, you know, your peers are, are doing things. Right, and, right. Um, and you know, that's, that's our only intent and goal from this report. Great, well thanks for sharing the information and uh, great to catch up, nice event. All right, thank you very much. Jeff. All right, he's calling and I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE with Sumo Logic Illuminate 2019. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. All right.